Welcome to episode 251. I am your host, Alpha Mike. We are transmitting high atop of Florida's peninsula at 108 feet today. We are getting back into the Wise Guy series where we talk, of course, for the remainder of the year about the Lucchese crime family. And today, our episode deals with Anello Meleglori. So, one of my Italian friends wanted to correct me on how to say me. Migliori. So now I know how to say it, and I'm going to drive you crazy saying it today. And uh, we've got a lot to cover. We've got 24 issues on our outline, so it's time to get your crayons and cord cardboard boxes. we got a lot to cover. How do you get in contact with us? Well, it's real easy. RadarCopNation.com uh, is our official website where you can, you can get more information, upcoming shows, and a little bit more about us. RadarCop.com is our audio website where you can hear all our episodes from number one to this one, number 251, and beyond. So we encourage you to get involved in those uh, episodes. Get in, you know, hook up with us. Look, we're back on Twitter, of all things. We're back on the little bird. We got one follower. One freaking follower. You don't know. There's no trolling there. Nope. Not on Twitter. What a joke. So you might be asking, what are you doing on Twitter anyway? You said you weren't going to be on there. Well, the reason that we're there is simple. What in the hell are all the con conservatives still doing there? Makes no sense to me either. So, when in Rome. Uh, we have our lineup for September, but I'm not going to go through it today on this episode because we got a lot to talk about. But one thing that I do want to talk about is the excitement that's happening in the state of California. God bless the people of California that have put up with the leftist BS for so, so long. They've got a candidate, Larry Eldler, <clears throat> which is standing up, as he says, we We've got a state to save, and he is getting more and more momentum. The Democrats are doing everything possible. They're in back rooms. They're in alleyways. They're walking around with sunglasses and Fondora hats looking to see how they're going to steal this special election because it looks like Governor Newsom is going to be booted out on his ass but that momentum is there. California is tired of the BS. They're tired of the Bolsheviks telling them what to do, how to do it, how much to pay, when they're allowed to breathe and not, taking away their civil liberties and just making life so freaking difficult for regular Americans. So God bless those Californians that are standing up with Larry Elder because... They have a state to save. Larry Elder, African-American, born in Compton, California, from humble, humble beginnings. Here he is, a conservative African-American, and he's given them the challenge. The left, they don't know what to do with, with a Larry Elder. They've even called him a white supremacist the face of the white supremacy. They don't even know what they're going to come up with, but screw them and off to victory in California. So we're very excited about that. I'm also excited about Kilo Sierra is coming on our airwaves this September. He's going to talk about his course on how to survive a gun battle. And it's a course that I want you to really pay attention to because I think you're going to learn a lot and, you know, combat is not shooting at paper silhouettes, looking at targets, controlling your breathing and all these things. It's just the opposite. And uh, Kilo Sierra is going to take us down range on that, and I'm excited about that course. And uh, But we'll cover that on my next episode, the lineup. I, and all, if you want to get... Uh, gun training with Kilo Sierra and you're in the Philadelphia area or New Jersey, his information is down in the bottom of the show notes. You want to get gun training in Florida, contact me, offradicopnation.com, 
And if I'm not in that area in Florida, I will contact, I will find you a very good firearms instructor in Florida to help you out. Because you're part of the militia, a well-regulated militia. They're talking about the National Guard. No, they're not talking about the National Guard, you worm, because it doesn't say National Guard. But militia is National Guard. Oh, go. Oh, my God. All right, here we go. So, we're going to cover the three stories from our delusional uncle at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, bumbling Joe Biden as he continues to baffle Americans. How can one individual be so incompetent? Tasha calm disturbance of the mental with her bipolar uncle, uh, bipolar. Our first story takes us to Uncle Joe, the resident at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, as he continues to ignore Afghanistan and the Americans that are trying to get out. Currently, there are six planes on the tarmac at Kabul, where over a thousand Americans are in the country. We don't know exactly how many are on these six planes, but they're not getting out. But according to the State Department, they said the Taliban said if they don't have papers, then they can't leave. But if they have papers, they can go. But in the meantime, it seems like this is day 24 of the American hostage crisis in Afghanistan produced and uh, directed by Joe Biden himself. Second story takes us to the media still flying cover for Uncle Joe as they make him a celebrity over the tropical storm that hit the Northeast. That's right. They've said basically that Joe just landed and gave a blanket of protection through the Northeast as he showed up with his checkbook and his crayons and started to write emergency bill checks in God knows the billions of dollars for the flooding that that tropical storm has created. The media has said Joe can do no wrong. And our last story from California as the Democrats are getting nervous because they can't get their own party to get excited about going out and voting. It appears that people just don't care and they wish that Newsom loses that's right folks another three happy stories coming from the Bolshevik states of woke the world that I live in and you live in that makes us all wonder how in the world but we continue with a smile on our face and as a result of that it's time for the joke of the week to make you all start laughing. Now, we don't want you to go away mad. We want you to go away happy. So that's why we have turned on the beat to get you all in the mood as we give you the joke of the week. I personally picked this joke because I thought it was funny. So here we go. An elderly couple is in church. The wife says to the husband, I've let out one of those silent farts. What do I do? The husband says, change the battery in your hearing aid. Come on, you got to give me credit for that one. There's no doubt about it that that one was funny. But you want to reserve your laughter for later? You can go ahead. Remember, there might be a copyright on the joke for you using later. Today's episode, number 251, where we talk about the Lucchese crime family in the Wise Guys series on our episode today, Anello Melegrori, and how he represented the changing of the guard and basically out with the old, in with the new, one of the last Mohicans of the Lucchese crime family. The clown is looking at me. They're about to let the horn go off, and we are about to start episode 251, Anello 
Migliori. Where's the what? What is the clown doing? Anello Migliori. He was a made member of the Lucchese crime family from associate to made member soldier to capo regime to consigliere to acting boss at one time. So he filled a lot of positions. And we're going to cover that. We've got 24 things on the agenda. I'm going to go over them. And um, I'm not, we're going to do it in a different format that we're also doing online. Before I used to write all this stuff out. And uh, a lot of people just read the show notes. And that was, you know, basically, well, okay, well, I'll listen to a little bit of it. So now you're getting just an outline, one word type of thing. So. We're going to talk about where he was born, his father, his early 20s, started as an associate under. His car was at the 1957 Mafia Summit. Who was in the car in Appalachian? Uh, The books open, Mele Glory becomes a made member. Mele Glory becomes a capo, serving as a a consigliere and an acting boss. When Tommy Ducks gets 100 years. Number 11, Jealousy of Other Lucchese Crews. Number 12, Migliori's Rackets. Number 13, Migliori's Mentors. Number 14, Anello's Responsibilities. Number 15, Moving Away from Gambling Operations. 16, Import from Italy would make him very rich. Number 17, Migliori and Tony Ducks had an exclusive with Home Depot. Number 18, Migliori trying to fly under the radar after Tony Ducks gets 100 years. Number 19, indicted in 1986, jailed in 88, and released in 91. Number 20, Target of the new leadership of the Lucchese crime family upon release. 20, uh, was that 21? 22? Well, this is 21. They wanted to whack him. 22, release from the hospital. He went under the radar. 23, when the boss, when, when the then boss went to jail, Migliori took a role in leadership. And number 24, Migliori passes. Now, let's start off. He's born 1933 in Corona, Queens. As we started this series with the Lucchese crime family, we took you to Corona, Queens. Thomas Lucchese wanted to establish Corona, Queens as the epicenter of for the Lucchese crime family. They had areas in the Bronx and areas in Manhattan, but they also wanted that section of Queens. It was important to them. Corona would become the little Italy in Queens, and the Lucchese crime family was right in the middle of it. Boss Thomas Lucchese would give that responsibility to his brother, his little brother, Joe Lucchese, which would become a capo, they, he would enjoy being a capo regime for many years until he told his brother Thomas, I need another capo in the region. And they brought in Joe Laratro. From Joe Laratro, this would be his understudy. And Laratro would mentor Anello Miliglori. 
into what he's going to become. Born 1933 in Corona, Queens, his father, Americo, would be a close friend of Joe Loratro. His father was not in the mafia, was not even an associate. Believe it or not, he was just a close friend of Joe Loratro. By the time Anello was in his 20s, he had been arrested several times for rackets, mostly with gambling. And as a result, Joe Loratro would take a liking to him and start nurturing him under his wing. He was identified as a member of Joe Loratro's crew by the New York City Police Department. His case number would be uh, number uh, letter B, as in Bravo, 522599. And the FBI always kept a file on him, too, known as file number 284211E Echo. As young Anello started to learn gambling and the operation under his mentor, Joe Loratro, his car in 1957 would be seen on the would be found on the scene in a small minor accident in the area where the Costa Nostra or the American Mafia would be having a summit. At the time, police swore that Anello Migliori would be there, but he wasn't. See, his car was borrowed by. Joe Loratro and Joe Lucchese. They drove his car up there and got into a small fender bender. So he was identified by authorities at that time having to have some association. I would say so. If your car or your body was found in 1957 in Appalachian, New York, during the Mafia Summit of Summits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was there. In the 1970s, the family books would be open to become members. So right here we see from that early beginning in 1957 that they had borrowed his car. We go all the way into the 70s. He's not made. He's about to be made in the 70s. The reason for him not being a made member at that time, the books were closed. 1957, the Mafia Commission at that time had made an allegation on the floor of that summit that Albert Anastasia, which was the boss of the Anastasia family that later would become the Gambino family, had been selling memberships into Costa Nostra. Outraged and pissed off, they decided the bosses of all families in the United States to stop, halt, no more, made members, the books would be closed. As such, Anello, Anello Migliori would sit around and wait. But as an associate, he would learn under the tutelage of Joe Loratro, the business. He had a lot of confidence in Ello that he would become a made member at sooner or later. And he enjoyed the power that it came with. You see, as an associate, he was rubbing elbows with some very powerful people. Joe Lucchese, Joe Loratro. Thomas Lucchese, yeah, you're up there. Tony Dux Corallo, yeah, okay. So the books would open in 1970, and he would be, of course, on there, and the induction ceremony would be conducted by Tony Dux Corallo. Arnello would later serve as a consigliere and an acting boss in the family, little bit later down the road but those are two other functions that he had although brief in that time consigliere being the counselor to the boss basically it's the position where 
if an, a maid member has a beef with another member or beef with something maybe that the boss has done, they will take it to the consigliere, which would take it to the boss in turn, supposedly. So it was a supposed papered fair process for all members. But nevertheless, it puts you in the chain of command as one of the top three of the family. So he had reached that level at some point. Uh, Tony Ducks Corallo, and we did an episode on him. He, of course, would take the boss position uh, soon enough. Of course, there was a little hip cup after Thomas Lucchese. The, the word on the street was that Tony Ducks might get it. And they also had uh, uh, other people that were on that supposed list. And it became a little confusing who exactly would fill the spot. But as we have said on prior episodes, Thomas Lucchese ran a tight ship. There was no confusion about after he passed, he had cancer, he had brain cancer, these things were well thought out and the Lucchese crime family was basically creating the guess who the boss theory is that the Genovese family had been starting to explore as well so there was no doubt but the man that comes up to the plate is Mr. Gibbs Tremonti he's again we talked about him in the French Connection episode. He's in the spot. While Tony Ducks was in prison, some people say, no, Thomas Gambino placed him there. Never, Carlo Gambino, sorry. Never, ever happened. And the reason for that is, I'm quoting Joe Bonanno, uh, uh, a family is their own sovereign nation. And a boss is in charge of his family. Bingo. So there was no outside entity. It was uh, by design. So Mr. Gibbs would take over and then eventually uh, Tony would, Ducks Corallo would come out. Mr. Gibbs got hammered on some narcotics charges and he goes in and Tony Ducks takes over. Tony Ducks now is the boss. And he has been working with uh, Anello. And ever since his prior mentor, which is Joe Laratro, kind of semi-retired in Florida in the 70s. So pretty much from the time Anello Migliori gets promoted or, or, or gets made, Uh, Joe Laratro is walking around with flip-flops heading towards Florida on retirement. Joe Lucchese had already gone out on on retirement. These guys made millions of dollars on rackets and they wanted to enjoy it at some point. And under the pressure and stress of everyday Costa Nostra, it was almost impossible And these guys had been there pretty much since inception, since 1931. And they did 30, 40 years uh, in that area, in that part of that position for the family, and they wanted to get out. At that time, uh, through the blessings of Laratro, Anello Migliori is allowed to go under Thomas, uh, excuse me, uh, Anthony Corallo, Anthony Ducks Corallo. So, <clears throat> and while he's under Tony Ducks, Tony Ducks is going to get in 1986, remember in the commission case, he's going to get slammed with 100 years. So things are definitely going to change. But by 1986, Anello was already a couple. Tony Ducks had made him a couple. 
And he basically took over for La Rocco in, in that position that he vacated. And he knew the, the rackets well. So here is Anello Meligro, Migliori that has basically learned under major players in Costa Nostra, especially in the Lucchese crime family. Thomas Lucchese, Joe Lucchese, and Joe Laratro. Now, there are others, of course, big names out there as well. But what these guys were perfect and experts at were rackets. We're not so much thugs and street guys, but they were good at the rackets. They were producing millions of dollars for the family and everybody knows from our last episode that we talked about Joe Laratro he ends up pulling in 15 million dollars a year for the Lucchese crime family in gambling and that was early on in maybe the 50s, 60s and 70s so those 15 million dollars back then were a ton of money a ton of money so he learned under very crafty people. Now, Anello Migliori's clout, right? Because you're part of royalty now of the Lucchese crime family, was not very well liked by the factions over in Brooklyn. Tony Ducks would be looking at and get hammered with 100 years in prison and it was no doubt to all the members of the Lucchese crime family that there was a new horizon. And all the families, remember, all four, four of the five bosses would get hammered with 100 years or more. The Bonanno family would be left out. But they were going to crazy spiral also because their boss would eventually uh, die. And uh, Rusty Ristelli, and as a result of his death, it caused a little havoc over there who was in charge and so forth. But nevertheless, four out of the five would get a hundred years. So all these four other families, all, all of them, were looking at a new leadership. And Anello Migliori represented that old faction. And the guys in Brooklyn resented it and they were jealous in a way because he was loyal, royalty. So, but really, to be honest, Anello didn't want the limelight. Once Tony Ducks got 100 years, he was just happy to disappear somewhere in a corner because he was making millions of dollars. He was into horses, sports book, policy, Manhattan numbers, Shylock, police, bribery, extortion, labor rackets, cigarette smuggling. This was just some of the stuff that he was extremely good at bringing in a lot, a lot of money. He would learn those Rackets as, long, as well as some union control. But most importantly, Anello Migliori would be part of the concrete business or the construction business for the Lucchese crime family. His boss and the family boss, Tony Ducks, had set him up just nice. The reason he was set up because not only was he loyal, he was smart. He was a good student, and as a result of being a good student, they started to give him more and more responsibility that basically would make him more and more money. His mentor, not only being Joe Laratro, was also a guy by the name of Frankie Bell Campanello. And Frankie Bell Campanello not only taught him the rackets, he taught him the thug aspect of the Lucchese crime family as well. So he wasn't naive to 
He was capable like many other people, but he was business smart. Anello, uh, Anello Migliori at one point would be making so much money into the millions in legitimate businesses that he really didn't need the mafia day-to-day operations. But of course, he wasn't leaving either. Anello would take on those responsibilities in the construction rackets as given to him by Tony Ducks. Anello would control the tile business and marble business in construction. So they would do a, a bidding for, let's say, a big building, and they wanted tile. Well, guess who they were going to get the tile from? That's right, Anello Migliori. Or if it was marble they wanted in certain parts of the building, there was that one company that they were going to get their pitch. Of course, everybody was going to get their fair share, but Migliori was not only getting a Costa Nostra cut, he was also getting his legitimate business cut as well. His father was in the tile business and marble business, making it very easy for him because he knew the business through his father. Mixing that together with controlling rackets, unions, and everything else that he learned from Costa Nostra, he becomes a multi-millionaire overnight. But then came 1970s, and New York State created two things that would make Anello Migliori think twice about gambling. One was the official lottery. The other was OTB, off-track betting, where you can bet on horses, and it was perfectly legal. And you got to go to a place, put down bets on the horses, watch it on TV, and the state was Costa Nostra at the time. So becoming into those businesses for the mafia, or Costa Nostra now, is more and more difficult. So they decide uh, that they've got to do other things. But Anello Migliori shows his talents because he'd make millions now nowhere near gambling. He would obtain contracts in Italy and excavate and import his own tile and marble, giving him a bigger product, uh, profit in his product. So, and that was the legitimate business. Migliori and Tony Ducks would become partners in the construction business, of course. Boss has to get the cut. And they had the exclusive. Okay, so Anello and Anello Pigliori and Tony Ducks Corallo had the exclusive tile and marble supply for Home Depot. Now, of course, back then, Home Depot isn't the Home Depot you know and I know today. But nevertheless, that shows you the influence that they had. Again, once Tony Ducks got 100 years for the commission case, that Rudy Giuliani brought forth in 1986, Migliori would avoid certain factions in the Lucchese crime family. He knew people didn't like him. He knew that he was the last McCoy. He knew that he was the last Indian standing and that a lot of the young Turks now saw it their opportunity to control The Lucchese crime family, from the time of inception, remember, we always use that date, 1931. They had operated in the Bronx in Manhattan. Uh, Tommy Lucchese, which was the undivorced, because remember, it was under Tommy Gagliardo, and he was the silent boss, the invisible boss, that he allowed his underboss, Tommy Lucchese, to run the family. He would... Thomas Lucchese eventually rolled into Corona, Queens, and it was very limited any other areas he was concentrating on. 
A lot of their operation in Manhattan was uh, East Harlem. So they were like that for many, many years. But there were factions, of course, in Brooklyn that they were not paid attention to up until 1986. So basically, you can look at from 1931, Inception, that's the date we're always going to refer to, to 1986 when Corallo gets 100 years. Brooklyn faction of the Lucchese crime family that was there was not really regarded as top leadership. And all of a sudden, now they see their opportunity to move in and control. And Migliori would get indicted in 1986, jailed in 1988, and eventually go and get sentenced. But his sentence would be overturned and he would be released in 1991. Now, once Migliori is released, the leadership has changed. There's no more Tony Ducks. He's in prison doing 100 years. Tony Ducks transfers the Lucchese crime family and we're going to talk more about that when we get to that part of the Lucchese history but the original person that Tony Ducks wanted to give it to all of a sudden no, he did, nobody's seen him he disappeared and then oh they say he's dead so it didn't work out the way Tony Ducks wanted to so he Tony Ducks knew that he had to turn it over to the Young Turks. He picks two, Vic Omuso and Gas Pipe and uh, Casio. Knowing full well they were the Brooklyn faction, that they were not really in that position to be boss. Now, everybody's capable of doing a lot of things in the Mafia. But we're talking about the level that Thomas Lucchese left his family. These two are going to step into. These are huge, huge shoes that he, they had to fill. And uh, they were schizophrenic, totally, totally paranoid. And they started to whack people left and right of course when Migliori gets on the gets released in 91 they swoop right in on him Migliori makes the mistake while sitting in a restaurant in Long Island he actually sitting close to the window of the restaurant allowing uh, a hit team for gas pipe and Vic Amuso to take out a 12-gauge shotgun and blast it through the window, striking Anello Migliori in the face. Although you might say, well, that's the end of him. He survived. I guess the window of the restaurant absorbed the majority of that impact. But nevertheless, after Migliori would get out of prison, excuse me, the hospital, he went deep radar undercover. He did make amends with Vicomuso, which would be a prison at that time. It's believed that he gave him up to $100,000 and stuff that really he shouldn't even be getting. But it showed Amuso that it was a branch offering of peace. You know, why are you trying to kill me? I'm not, I'm not trying to become boss. That was the message Migliori was sending to Amuso. As a result, uh, Amuso would tap into Migliori later on for leadership, a, a leadership role. From the time of that shotgun blast, things would change. You're talking about he's a couple. He's been groomed by royalty the Lucchese crime family he is a multi-millionaire over and over he has a bunch of businesses legitimate businesses would be of course the towel company that 
of, we discussed he had tall marble company that was located in Corona on 103rd Street and 37th Avenue. And, you know, that's right in the mecca of uh, Corona. And he would be in that business together with Tony Duck Corallo. He also had a funeral home that still exists today. It's called Migliori Funeral, and it's in Corona, and it's in the same street you know, on 103rd. And it's operated, well, it, at least it was operated. I'm not really sure if she's still alive, his sister. He also had top a topless club in Long Island, and he was into real estate and, of course, construction. He was making so much money at that time that he was perfectly consent. You know, he, he, he wasn't looking for headaches and becoming part of the leadership, but of course, if the family called upon him, he wasn't going to renege because he knew that would be a death sentence. So since he had paid off Vika Musso some large amounts of money of $100,000, Vic said he's a good earner and I'm going to tap into him so I can get some more of that. Of course, gas pipe, Casio would turn on everybody and become a snitch. And that was the underboss of the Lucchese crime family. Vic Amuso would become boss, still in prison today, over uh, almost close to 40 years, well, 35, 36 years he's been in prison and uh, he's still, at least on paper, the boss. Of course, they're acting bosses. But Vicka Musil would eventually put Anello Migliori on a panel of three. Now, the panel of three are three bosses, three couples, couple regimes that are running the family. And... On day-to-day operations, one would probably run certain legitimate, um, illegitimate businesses. The other ones would run other rackets and so forth. And the council of three would get together if they had to make some major decisions. Of course, majority would win in that decision. Because it would become more and more troublesome and difficult to reach out to a sitting boss in prison. This is an epidemic. It first started with uh, Vito Genovese in the 60s. Staying as boss and trying to get the word out what he wanted became very difficult. It also was for the Colombo family under... Karma and Persico, which did probably in the area of uh, 35, 36 years in prison. And there were wars fought to try to dethrone Karma and Persico that were not successful. So he could, he stayed as boss, even though he was in prison. Very difficult to do. Um, Rusty Ristelli, the boss of the Bonanno family, same thing. Very difficult to try to get those orders out. In Rusty Ristelli's case, uh, Lilo, better known as Carmine Galante, got out of prison after 20 years and said, I'm in charge. Because Joe Bonanno had made him underboss, and so the boss is not around, I'm it. So it's very difficult to do. Vicka Musso's been doing it, but there is the Council of Three. Eventually, he would never really retire Canelo Migliori, being a wealthy man. In On September 12, 2019, at the age of 85, he would pass away. He was true to the life. He never snitched. He did... Uh, several prison terms not amounting to a whole lot of time maybe at three years got a, a lot of arrests when he was younger but the bottom line is the millions and millions of dollars that he made he really didn't pay for it with uh, prison sentences 
Of course, a shotgun blows blast to the face makes you rethink life. Up next, the concrete business as we continue on the Wise Guy series, the Lucchese crime family stranglehold on the concrete business or the construction business, part of the commission case later on. But we will discuss that in episode 252 as we move down the road with the Wise Guys series and Lucchese crime family for the remainder of the year. It's a lot to unpack, and we have been doing that. So let's close things out with the word of the week from the book of 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. It says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come time of difficulty. It might be now. There's a lot of difficulty going on. And I'm afraid to report probably a lot more difficulty in the future. As always, it is my honor and pleasure to be your host on Radio Cop Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your community, the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And most importantly, continue to pray for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out.